Pricing your surface pattern design work for clients and for outright sale can be a really tricky endeavor. There's a lot of different factors that can go into finding fair pricing. And in order to have a more standardized approach for the entire industry, there is a new Facebook group called Fair Pricing for Surface Pattern Designers. I am super, super excited to be bringing these two ladies to you today. I am with Portia Monberg and Pippa Shaw, and I am really excited because we're having a conversation about fair pricing in surface pattern design. And Portia started a Facebook group, which I'm definitely going to link below that you should join if you're a surface pattern designer, um, where we're having the conversation about what is fair pricing and trying to be really transparent about those numbers. Um, Portia, will you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I've actually worked in graphic design for 20 plus years. And I just found that I kept being drawn to illustration and that was what I wanted to do, but I didn't have a lot of confidence in my ability. So I just slowly started working more illustrations into my graphic design. And then that kind of led me to discover surface pattern design. And I just fell in love and I love making patterns and I love just kind of the decorative art aspect of it. Um, so I've been making patterns for, I'd say seven to 10 years kind of on my own. But just recently, I've decided to start reaching out to potential clients and selling them. And that's when I realized that the pricing is kind of messed up in this industry, especially when compared to graphic design. Yeah. Um, and I think other brands, I don't know as much about them, but I think other branches of illustration just from research I've done. And so that's what led me to start this group. I love that. That's I mean, I could go off on all of that information just there, but Pippa, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? So I'm Pippa, I'm based in France, but I'm British and I've got a degree in fine art. So I'm coming from a fine art background and I worked in advertising. I've done some product design. I've worked in other industries as well over the years, trying to pay off student loans and but I've always, always been a practicing artist and I absolutely love fabric and fabric is the reason that I got into surface design because I was like, hey, I want to design fabric. How do I get my designs on fabric? So I train myself up, I learned Adobe Illustrator, I incorporated lots of drawing and painting and experimentation and I've been doing this for, I'm trying to think now, quite a few years. <laughs> and I major, I would say, in fabric design, but I also design greetings cards and various different products. And as uh, Portia said, it's um, yeah, I was quite surprised at some of the pricing in the industry when, especially coming from an advertising background, when you see the budgets that are given to people for that kind of work, it's kind of I wonder how people manage to make a living. <laughs> yeah. And so if you don't know me, I am Elizabeth Silver and I have been doing surface pattern design. Um, I, I actually have a degree in surface pattern design. So I have been working for about 18 years, 19 years in this business. And I started my career working corporate, um, you know, working in-house for home textiles and also uh, for, for apparel. And then I moved to freelance about nine years ago and that has given me a different perspective than these two ladies. And I think that that has really, I'm, that's why I'm trying to hang out with these two ladies, because I think that has kind of limited me because in corporate, I have seen sort of how art is churned through, you know, and as an independent artist, it's not sustainable in a corporation everything is just quick turnover, quick turnover. So there's a real disconnect. And so I have long been, you know, thinking sort of that, oh, this is just the way it is. But then looking at industries like graphic design and, and advertising, wondering like, why is our, our discipline um, valued less? And so that's why when Portia was starting this group, I was like, I definitely want to be involved in any way I can, because I think it's, it's such an important conversation to have. And it's something that, you know, 
there's, I mean, we could go on forever. And so last week we had our first meeting and I said, we have to record this. People want to hear this. People who are in the industry want to know this kind of information. And for the three of us who have been working surface pattern designers, who know the fees we've been offered, who have had various client experiences, this is, you know, even just a conversation about it is, is valuable information for people who are just getting into this industry. So that is what we landed on last week. And this week we're here recording for everyone to listen to. And one thing that we talked about last week was that besides getting into numbers, which Portia is doing a great job starting that conversation in the Facebook group, again, link below, go join this Facebook group. Um, and she started by um, doing surveys. Um, and Portia, do you want to talk about the recent survey that you just, you started with in your group? Sure. Yeah. So we decided to start with something that's relatively simple because pricing can get pretty complex when you get into fabric and collections and various things. So we started with greeting cards and I just reached out to the group and asked experienced greeting card designers to fill out a small survey where they talked about royalties flat fees, licensing deals. And then I was able to publish the results. And that way other people who didn't either see the survey or just didn't feel like filling it out could weigh in. And now we're trying to just work towards what we as a group think would be a fair price for greeting cards. And then I just wanna let everyone know what that is. And you know, at the end of the day, pricing is gonna be a very personal decision but I want people to be able to go in with all the information possible. Totally agree. And, and so when we were talking about this last week, I sort of had the, the thought that it all depends on your perspective, right? So again, me coming from seeing it in house and seeing how, how it has wor always worked is where I'm sort of like, oh, well, you know, that's fine. And you guys coming from graphic design and from advertising and seeing how they get paid and what's the difference. I mean, we're doing not, you know, whatever, we're doing equal amounts of work, if not, you know, putting more of ourselves into it. Um, so why should it be different? And that kind of led us to say that numbers are super important, but another aspect of it is things that you need to know about pricing, things that you might not realize of when you get into pricing that you know are really gonna shift your perspective on, on the numbers because you can come into pricing and Porsche's survey could tell you that you know a greeting card, you could earn $750. But if you're a fine artist who's been selling her you know, eight by 10 paintings that would work perfectly on a greeting card for, you know, uh, two thousand dollars then you might say that's super low and if you're someone who's been putting your work on shutterstock and selling it for you know a dollar a piece and getting two cents a piece or whatever you might say 750 dollars i could never get that money so depending on where you're coming from the numbers you know are easy to dismiss right because you say i don't that doesn't really line up with anything i know about so we wanted to talk about today three things, we're hoping to get it down to three. We all came with some suggestions. We don't have those things yet. Um, three things that would be like, if you were just getting into surface pattern design and someone asked you, you know, I wanna give you a hundred dollars for your pattern. Three things before you even respond to that, what should you know going into a client, you know, a talk with client or a licensing agreement or whatever? What are the things that are so important um, to understand before you even think about numbers. And so I'm really excited. We all came up with three, or in some case, I have a couple extra random ones. So we're going to talk about them all because all of them are valuable and important, and then see if we can pick the top three that are going to make the most sense for someone to know. And then we're going to try to spread the word on those three things. So um, Pippa, do you want to start with, with what you, you came up with? Hi. Uh the first thing that came into my head was know your worth or value, but also know your work's worth and value to your client. Yes. So, yes. You know, even if you're new to maybe surface design, but you've been working as a fine artist for years, you're not coming, you know, in at the bottom, you've got years of experience, you know, and talent and skill and 
if you went to you know university or college to train you know like we did you know you got student loans you know that you've had to pay off it's all is all a monetary value that has gone into your skills and your portfolio your the way you can see differently to everybody else which makes you different to everybody else and also look at your client's product if they're selling a greeting card for four dollars and you know they get you ask them obviously how many they expect to manufacture and then you go well hang on a second the hundred dollars if they're going to sell twenty thousand dollars worth a hundred dollars for the thing that's going to sell the card you know that's not very much is it Right. So just really think things through, really think about what you're bringing to the client and think, you know, what the client is going to get from what you provide them with. Just because that. it's art doesn't mean it's it's not valuable. If anything, that art is more valuable because only you can do it. If you have a brand, if you have a style, only you do that. If someone copies you, they copy you. But if you're, a, you know, true to yourself and true to your brand, you know, that is the reason the client came to you and wants to use your work. I... Or maybe not, or maybe not, you know, they might not care. <laughs> but then they can go and, you know, find someone who does every style and, you know, isn't the same quality as you, but just think these things through. Yeah, I, I love that. I have something similar. Portia, do you have anything kind of in that same vein on your list or no? Yes. I mean, my first thing was value yourself, value your time, value your art. And it's really saying the same thing as Pippa. Yeah, I exactly. Kind of have like a little tagline. And then also a point that I made to you guys last week is that I think within the industry, there's a tendency to pay less for simple designs and more for more complex designs. But I think that that's kind of backwards. Like Pippa said, you should look at the end product. Like what are they going to be making from your art? And at the end of the day, if simple art sells it just as well or better than complex art, then I feel like the artist should be compensated um, for that. That's so true because, you know, like right trends come and go, right? But right now, one big trend is like just kind of those abstract shapes that are sort of like a half circle here and a blob mm -hmm. over here. Right. And like they make some really beautiful products. Like I love that look. Uh, but in theory, I could just draw a couple like, you know, round dish blobs and a half circle and I've made that same pattern right but not real that's not true you know that it's it's my sense or whoever the artist's sense of balance color um all the things and there are certain artists who just excel at that and certain mm -hmm. artists who are not abstract artists and even the idea of making some weird blobs would would be hard <laughs> a little bit hard to get it right right so that is so true I love that because also, yeah, you are very right. That's like, if you look at, I think so far the standard for pricing in this industry, people always bring it up is the Graphic Artist Guild Pricing and Ethical Guidelines uh, book. And part of the reason it's a standard is because it's the only thing that exists. You know, the, the pricing guidelines actually do address surface pattern design, which is we are very often overlooked. Illustration, maybe greeting card illustration, but the idea of surface pattern design, which is designed for products basically, is usually overlooked, but it is called out in that guide. And it's true. It's like they give you a price range and then they say like simple few colors versus like super complex eight to 10, you know, colors. And, and I understand that because it can mean, you know, your time, obviously, if you're doing something really complex, but as well, who is it Van Gogh or Picasso like drew you always hear that story about he drew like a really quick uh sketch of a woman in a park like in 30 seconds and tried to charge her whatever two hundred dollars and she was like that took you two minutes and he was like and 20 years of experience yeah, exactly it's that and 20 years thing and I think people yeah really yeah I'm butchering the story but yes exactly the yeah. 20 years experience um what I can do uh in yeah in an hour is far superior, no offense, to someone who has been doing this for one, you know, week. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, having that a really, a really important part of it is the decision-making process. You know, you hone that over years and years and years, you know, you, there's so many possibilities and the job of an artist is to be endlessly making decisions. Am I going to use a bright pink or a light pink? Am I going to put a teal or a blue? Am I going to make this larger? Am I going to get rid of this part? 
you know it's all about balance and it's just like anything else it's a muscle it's a skill and you you hone your own version of it and that is really valuable and you know I can start out with a really complex idea for a design and then I end up making something very simple with maybe one of the icons but I went through the decision making process so you might just see a very simple design at the end but you haven't seen all the processes as I've been through to get to that point and to decide that that is the best use of it and you know once you've made it you can't make it again either so that also has a value just because it's simple you know you can't make that same pattern again so and if it's something that speaks to people if it's this kind of thing that people want in their homes that has a lot of value yeah I agree so I had something similar as well which is oh. your time <laughs> so I think it sounds like we've got, maybe got our number one yeah. which is your time and work is value. It's less snappy than you guys is, but basically your time and work is valuable and your fees should reflect that. I also kind of put a side note of like low offers don't equal bad work. Like basically if someone's telling you, I'm going to give you this much, it doesn't mean your work is bad. It just means unfortunately they're, you know, but that's kind of really your time and work is valuable is, is what my idea is. And I think you guys all have the same idea. So, you know, making it something snappy, like uh, Porsches might be the way to go. But I think that that is an important pillar, just understanding value of, of what you what you do. And that is its own kind of journey. Unfortunately, I don't know if, a, you know, like a platitude can can give that to people. But even just this discussion, if anyone's listening, when people listen to it will help them see some of the points behind it and how it does take you know knowledge and skill to to make something that is going to sell products awesome so pippa what's your second one then well i think you should go next elizabeth because uh, oh, okay, otherwise okay. We, keep, we keep trumping you <laughs> no no what are you not definitely not um so my second one is you don't have to take the first offer, even if it's your first job. Pricing is subjective and negotiable. So just a reminder that just because a client is offering it to you, that, that doesn't mean that that's the end of the story and that's all that you can get. And, and I think a lot of people are, are really scared about negotiating. And obviously, hopefully most people understand that it is a negotiation, but not everyone does. And especially when you're starting out, it's like, oh, I'm just so grateful to have a client. I'm so grateful to have someone interested and not feeling like you have that leverage to make a counter offer. Um, so basically just the idea that pricing is a negotiation and, and that it's something to, um, you know, to, to work with. Does anyone else have anything along that line or is that, does that resonate at all? Yeah, that was my second point, negotiate. Oh my goodness, tell me what yours was. <laughs> Learn how to negotiate. Learn how to so negotiate, I, yeah. There's some bullet points, the things that occurred to me to maybe ask yourself. If they say they want to a full buyout of your design, which means selling the copyright, you have, you know, you can't do anything with any of the elements ever again. Ask yourself, do they really need all the rights? And if you think that they're, you know, in an industry where they only need the rights for greetings cards, you know, they only make greetings cards and don't be afraid to ask them, do you really need all the rights? You know, um, you can negotiate, you can say, well, I'll give you an exclusive right for greetings cards for five years, or you can even do something called a market buyout where you give them the rights in perpetuity for that market. But then you still give yourself more possibilities to you know, make some money from a good design because the chances are if one company likes it, lots of other companies will like it too. So, or if it's a greetings card, you can use the elements you know, for a pattern, for a fabric, or, you know, wrap, gift wrap, or something like that. And then my other point I had was, um, if you think a design has potential for lots of different markets or is a signature design in your particular style that you think is an important part of your brand, then don't be pushed to sell it because I've had that situation a few times where I've had some companies who like really wanted to buy all the rights for a couple of designs, but me being me, I was attached to them and I'm really, really pleased now that I said no because I've licensed them in 
of maybe 80% of them I would have licensed. They knew they were going to be. You can just tell sometimes. You just say, yeah, this is going to be a good one. It might not happen straight away. But, you know, you kind of have a feeling over time what, that what will work and won't, what won't. And just I looked at one of my designs that I thought of when I was thinking about this. And I've worked out that I've already earned five times the amount of money from that design than what I was offered for the full buyout. So, awesome. I mean, that, that's a, a really good example. That was the one that came into my head because it was probably one of my most popular designs. But yeah. It just goes to show, you know, and there's still however many years left for me to license it, you know, so. Yeah. It's a lot. That's, yeah, that's interesting because I, like, I feel like in the past I have said, like, you don't have to be super precious with your art, like, because I do feel that, oh, you know, we're artists, we can, re we can create, we can create. Um, and I think I do still believe that to some degree, but there are, obviously there are, other, there are exceptions. Like there's some stuff that's in my portfolio that's been sitting there for years. And if someone offered me $500 for it, you know, yeah. maybe I'd be into it because it's been there for a long time. It's never been licensed. It's just sitting there. But if it's something that, you know, there are still some designs that haven't been licensed, but I still love them dearly and think that they should be going farther than they necessarily are and that's where you know that's where those signature pieces where you feel mm. you know that you can do something different yeah um, certainly every piece that's for sure but you just know sometimes don't you you just or you put a lot of your heart and soul into it and yeah it becomes a part of you almost yeah but you do have to learn to let go too i mean that is another skill yeah yeah um I also had, well, I had it kind of as a separate thing, but the rights thing, which I think we'll get into more, but Portia, do you have anything around that or what is your next? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with everything you two have just said, um, but then kind of a specific point is if clients reach out to you and ask you like, well, what's your price for a certain design? Um, don't be afraid to turn it around on them and say, what do you pay? Because I think mm -hmm. in the beginning, it's a lot of pressure to have to try to come up with prices and for clients are all over the map. So you would really like to get like a stake in the ground from them and then get an idea. Like, is this even something I want to bother negotiating with or, mm -hmm. you know, are they like in the ballpark and I can work with this? So. Yeah. I know it's to hear their estimates. It's like, I see what you're saying. If it's like in the range, you could still, but again, remembering that it is still negotiable. So they might say whatever, and then you can come back. Well, can I do, um, you know, can we do an extra hundred dollars, but do, as you said, the rights thing. So Pippa's, you know, discussion about rights, that's a really important thing. There's a big difference between buying your art completely and then never having any access to it again versus a category buyout where they buy just the rights for a greeting card or for a just fabric or something where it's got a limited term, right? So, and you, I love to reuse pieces of my old artwork. So what you're saying, Pippa, is so true. It's like, yeah. once you sell something in theory, you once you sell something, you cannot use, you know, those pieces again, if they're very distinct, right? Um, so having, you know, being able to take um, my fabric designs, like even just the one that I have behind me right now, it's a fabric design. It's, it's from my licensing portfolio. So it is able to be used, however, um, and it's all over dinosaurs. And I just saw a thing on Instagram that, um, you know, graph shop graphic has, uh, debuted the card that I designed in with the dinosaur and the rainbow. It's all the same stuff. I just added lettering and made it into uh -huh. a reading card basically. So those are two situations where, yeah, I'm using different pieces. And that's what I like to do when I design my licensing portfolio. So if you're selling your work you, you don't have that flexibility and it's true like you say as well if you do want to sell work then it's good to know before you go in to start designing you know that I'm selling this you know so maybe think about I think Elizabeth you brought this up uh, last week when we chatted and you say you know like I should have set aside this much time because it won't be worth my while if I you know, spend a whole week on this and I'm only going to be able to sell it for $750, then, you know, that kind of doesn't make economic sense. So, right. you know, it's good. To, and also, I find if I know, like if they, a client contacts me and asks me to make a piece of work specifically for them, then that's for them. I know it's for them, you know, and 
then you don't have the kind of the heartbreak when you you know if you someone wants says oh they want to take it away from you you know because you know from the start this is this is how it's how it's yeah. going to work and yeah I was going to say as well is that with negotiating it doesn't just have to be the price you negotiate if the client really is their maximum budget is say $650 and you would want some more money, then instead you might be able to negotiate the terms of the contract. So you can really shrink down what they're gonna have rights to use it for, because then that opens up opportunities for you to license maybe in another country, if they only need it for the US rather than worldwide, or you can negotiate the time down to a year instead of three years, or, you know, there's, it's not just the money part because you know there are some companies you know that's the way they work the maximum price that they will pay is mm -hmm. but if they really sit down and think about you know what what the terms are then you might be able to negotiate and then feel more comfortable about yeah or even I was just thinking like more samples or the ability mm. to like wholesale like buy at wholesale yeah. and sell through your own Etsy shop you know I know some licensing artists do that they get you know whatever they're product is being made then besides just getting the royalties they also are able to buy the product at wholesale and then resell it at a markup through their own yeah. channels their own shop um, so that's another thing you could add into your terms yeah. so I think maybe uh, if we were to sort of crystallize this it would be something about you know something about you know no like know your negotiate or like understand the negotiation terms and then like some bullet points of you can you know rights uh you know rights samples this that the other I don't, i'm not that didn't crystallize at all but <laughs> that's, you guys can make it something good <laughs> what do you think Portia? you have any way to make that like really <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we need a snappy yeah we do need i'll think that. about it but i actually wanted to mention something else i was listening to an interview with pat kokale uh the other day and she mentioned having all these different bargaining chips. Like one of them was social media mentions. And I, I can't remember the other ones. And maybe we can link to her interview. But um, it was a really fantastic idea because it was, she kind of puts all these things in. And so it lets the company say no to more things, sort of, so she can get the things that are the most important to her. I just thought it was really clever. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that sort of how now you're from the graphic design world. So maybe, I don't know, it depends, but I feel like this is how graphic designers often package their like branding packages and stuff. They have like tiers of like, well, for this much money, I will do your logo for this much money. I'll do your logo and your like whatever letterhead and your whatever else that you need if different assets. And then for this much money, I'll do all your assets and blah, blah, blah. So when you put it in tiers, you could do something like that. You could say, well, you just offered me $500. Well, cool for $500. You can have, you know, the pattern for one year in the U S for $750. You can have the pattern for three years in worldwide and yeah i'll show it on my social media and whatever for a thousand dollars you can have whatever the full full package would be the um and so so something like that could be could be a really good technique i love that mm. so we have to think we have to think about how to make that snappy but i think in general understanding that there is flexibility in terms right yeah. um and maybe little... things that you wouldn't just using things that you wouldn't think of right away and like Pippa was saying it doesn't always have to be money it can be other mm -hmm. terms and also I think I mentioned last week sometimes there's a brand you know that means a lot to you they have really good ethics you know or they're ecologically conscious you know and you know sometimes you think I really want to work with this brand and you know I, you, you feel like you're getting something different you know from it other than money that you know is part of your brand and something you want to associate with something you want to support you know like I know you know some graphic designers do you know work for free for some charities you know because they want to you know it's like like making a donation almost but obviously you know I'm not saying work for free at all but you know there's you know there's you know everybody yeah has there's exceptions to every everything really yeah, that's not but, but I would say don't work for free. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Even, even a charity can pay you something. Yeah. yeah. So, and they will value you more if they're paying you. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big problem is 
there's such a tendency to take advantage of artists if they give away mm -hmm. and they'll just put you through so many like changes and it could just go on forever if you don't yeah and people happens. just think it's easy that's it the people yeah. Just yeah. think it's easy because it is like fun because I draw dinosaurs and rainbows like Right. it's easy and and again it's like well yeah in 20 years it's a little bit easier for me I'll tell you that but it's not it's still not you know just like in 20 years it's easy for a doctor to quickly see that you know that cough is a cough for a certain type of you know illness but right. that doesn't mean that it didn't it didn't take a while to get there so yeah that's so true and they'll well, value that more they'll value it if they paid for it they'll value it if it's free you know, it's human nature. You, you tend not to value the things that you, you don't pay for. It's true. Think of all those PDFs that you've downloaded with a guide about this or a guide about that or how to do this. And some of them are, you have to read right away, but some of them just sit in my downloads folder. So the yeah. grave of free PDFs. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I hear that. Yeah, but if I paid for a course that was, you know, whatever, $200, then I'm going to definitely open it up. It's not sitting in my downloads folder, right? So it makes a difference. One thing that's interesting too is I think if clients find out that you work on the computer, like I don't know if you get that question sometimes, but it's like, oh, are you a computer artist? And then there really is this thought, and I think this happened more with graphic design, that you literally have a button on your computer that's like design. <laughs> As if you don't have to sketch or put thinking into it. It's just... I mean, it, like you guys are saying, people just don't get it, like how much time it takes. Well, my sister is a graphic designer and she was recently was on um, Shutterfly making like um, those, you know, like a photo book basically. And she was like, now I understand why everyone thinks it's just a click because they have these extremely complex, uh, you know, software that makes it just a click and that an artist has already drawn all the elements and suggested ways that those elements could work together and that, you know, they have the sizing and you can type in your own lettering and whatever it is and choose all the fonts with the suggested fonts, et cetera. It's all the work is done up front so that anyone can get on Shutterfly, put in their four pictures of their vacation and have a beautiful spread, right? Yes. Um, so there is something to be, but all that stuff comes from, you know, like Shutterfly has invested so much money, I'm sure, in, in making that platform and having that artwork and having everything, you know, having those example pages where they show you how you can use these various little, you know, tidbits to put together a really pretty, um, photo album so yeah I actually freelanced at Shutterfly so I know uh, the people that made those books <laughs> nice so yeah exactly then you maybe you've drawn some elements or helped to help you know put things together and that's exactly it it's like it is a lot of work and uh and but it makes it seem to the to the person who is not a designer um you know the everyday person that it, it can just be a click and drag thing but Oh, well, <laughs> all right, Portia, what's your, what do you have next on your, your um, list? Well, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I don't know if this is going to be more me, but I, <clears throat> it has to do with just the general public and valuing surface design and decorative arts. And I was thinking of two things. One is that uplift is a really positive thing in our world. Um, and so if your designs are providing uplift for people, that's really something to be proud of. Um, okay, and, and it has to do with uh, kind of what you're saying. Like people think, oh, you drop so easy. You draw like rainbows and unicorns and, you know, but, you know, it's actually hard and aspects of it can be quite tedious and the training that goes into it and the, you know, perfecting your craft, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that decorative or decoration is not a dirty word because like within the world of graphic design, there's so much pressure to be conceptual, to really put like infuse ideas and like, you know, academic concepts into your work, which is fantastic if you can, but there is a place for decoration. And a lot of what we do essentially is decorative. So I just wanted to share those thoughts and I don't know how they fit into like a bullet point, but. I relate to that so much before, I think it was before I had even fully chosen my major in college. I remember taking a course and it was like, you had to make a, some sort of like poster board thing that was giving a message. 
And after having gone through foundation art that was all about, you know, here's every classic painter and what every single thing was means, quote unquote means, my poster, the idea of my poster was some art is just for fun. Like some art <laughs> is just art. Like sometimes purple is just purple. It's not royalty. It's not like deep under, you know, basically that was my thing. And here I am as a service pattern designer. I have never been one to be like, there's some deeper meaning in my work. Right. I just want it to be cute and fun and pretty and, and make me, yeah, it makes, makes me happy. And every surface designer, not everyone, but many surface designers, if you ask them why they do what they do or what they want their work to convey, it's happiness, right? Everyone right. says that. I want my work to make people happy. I do this because it makes people happy. It makes me happy to see this work. Happy, happy, happy. And okay. I mean, what a gift, right? That's, mm. you're so right. That's such a, that is, it's a gift. Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah. There's a snobbery, you know, and, you know, there's always levels, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I've never been a fine artist. It's just not my thing. So. And, and, and the idea that we can be, like I say, I call surface pattern fun and functional, right? So the, yeah. the idea that you can do that and, and it's useful to people and it's, it makes everything look better. I just, that's, yeah. I mean, that's why I'm passionate about this, this discipline for sure. So, so yeah, I love that. So uplift, um, you know, the fact that it's uplifting is, is just as valuable as any other discipline, basically. Like music or, you know, anything else that... Right. Going to a restaurant or, you know... Yeah. It's like those magic moments. I mean, you know, they don't come around all the time. So if you have something in your home that you come back from a hard day in the office and you look at it and you're like, you know, it makes you smile, that's worth a lot. Yeah, I know. Imagine if everything in your house was just solid color or just every shirt you own. Look at Portia's gorgeous shirt. Like imagine yeah. if everything we had was solid and every it's like the decorative, you know, the decorations make make the thing. So I'll never forget going to Denmark um, when I was in my mid 20s and this was in the mid 90s. And I was just astounded that everything there was beautiful. Like they had a beautiful toaster oven. You know, design thinking was way ahead in Europe, you know, from the States. And that was, I think, around the 90s, maybe their Alessi was really popular. I don't know if you guys know who he was. He yeah. had like amazing tea kettles. And oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I feel like some of it has been more infused into American culture now, but not, I don't feel like to the same point. And that was my first time seeing Ikea. My Danish relatives took me to Ikea and I was like, wow, what is this place? That so that's the difference um all right so is there a uh, pippa did you have one more on your list yeah i just had my last one was think long term like think about the big picture so i think you know anyone who's been in this industry for a while will tell you that you know you, you hear about all these you know people say you know saying you know if you take my course I'll tell you all the secrets and then you'll be successful you know immediately and I guess that happens. your service pattern business my link below no <laughs> just joking <laughs> okay sorry continue well, that makes your courses no. good because you're realistic you know um, you tell people you have to put a lot in to get some, yeah. a lot out you know it's, yeah yeah there's no magic sauce. Yeah, and that's so true. Yeah, it, it absolutely it. isn't. There is no magic. It's true. You know, and someone who's you know, successful now, they went through a whole load of things, you know, 10 years ago to get where they are now. It wasn't an overnight success. And what worked for them 10 years ago is not going to work for you now, probably. It, aspects of it will, but, you know, trends change and, you know, everybody dif is different. Everyone has a different family situation people have kids to look after some people don't some people have you know a husband who you know can look after the finances well you know so you have less pressure and other people really do need to you know do it as something on the side until they can build up a a, a long-term sustainable pipeline of of work and that's why you know people diversify as well so you have some maybe print on demand things that build up slowly over time and then you try and find licensing work and then you just build up because you don't want to leave your job 
and go, right, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all in, and then find that you can't pay your bills. And then the worst thing for creativity is having financial stress. Mm. So I was thinking, just ask yourself, is this pricing sustainable? Mm. I'm like that question. You know, you say, you know, you're desperate to get some, say you spent a thousand dollars on courses and you're desperate to get some of your investment back, but if someone offers you a hundred dollars and they'll, they'll, it's going to be hard to get them, you know, you think, oh yeah, the first time and then, you know, in a year's time I'll be getting five hundred dollars, but no, they'll keep coming back to you and expecting a hundred dollars. I mean, a hundred percent, they sure will. That's how it is. And have a, just have a long-term mindset. If, you're really serious about this business and you've invested a lot of time and energy and money into learning how to do this, then you've got to know that you're in it for a long, long term. So like I said, with the, if you have the signature bit of pattern that you really don't want to let go of, because, you know, think long term, think that you, over time, it will be worth, you know, maybe it's a small, little bit of a sacrifice now, but just step back try and get out of the moment and you know, you know kind of, it's kind of intense when you're first trying to negotiate your first deals with clients and also the other thing that I that came to mind when I was thinking about this was don't just as well think about yourself think of about other designers because actually I find that surface designers are some of the nicest people in the world like I've met so many wonderful wonderful people going to trade shows and I kind of you know you've got to we're a, we're a team you know we don't have any unions looking out for us so we have to look out for each other so or if yeah. you're really at the beginning and you admire you know a certain designer or a certain artist if you then accept a hundred dollars like you're hurting them because you're bringing down the level in the industry and that will hurt the designer that inspired you to start designing and then maybe you know ultimately it's not sustainable for them because that is their main source of income. Maybe they pay the, um, you know, all their bills, you know, for the whole family with that. So just try and take a step back and think a bit more big picture. All right. Pippa's and the official preacher of this, uh, <laughs> of this group she's the one to tell all the, that that is all so true I love that question is this pricing sustainable that is and thinking long term in general is that's excellent I love that um yeah it's it's because I was I've been there like I you know I really have been there because I was in this position eight years ago when I change jobs. And I always tell the story of like, oh, I thought it was just going to be so easy to transition because I was already a surface pattern designer. I was like, oh, I just need to get a couple clients. And it was really difficult. And I was in a position where I didn't have a lot of financial stress. I was lucky that my, my husband worked full time, but on the other hand, I had a very big drive to succeed and prove myself. I thought it was going to be easy. And and my skill set was surface design. So I remember, you know, hearing all this advice, you know, I was in Lilla Rogers Matt's course. Um, and, you know, hearing all this advice, don't, don't sell yourself too low, don't do this. And, and I was sort of like, yeah, but what if, like, how else do I make money? You know what I mean? Like, it's coming to, if, if people are offering me $100 for my skill set, and I know I can do it, you know, in whatever amount of time, I'm still making money, like a short amount of time. I mean, you know, I'm still making money and, and that's my skill set. I have to earn money for my skill set, whether you're a hairdresser who works at um, cost cutters or one who works at the fanciest LA salon, you know, unfortunately, like the cost cutters woman is not making uh, that much money. And it's like, so where do you, where do you go from there? And I've definitely taken really, really low fees. And I'm grateful that I've been able to uh, get rid of those clients, raise my prices with various clients, you know, and, and move on up. But when that's your skill set, you just want to use your skill set to bring in income. So that's where we land, you know, that's where we land in this kind of situation. And if I was thinking long-term, I would definitely have seen that that wasn't sustainable. Um, but, you know, it's like, oh, well, how, you know, someone is going to pay me to design. I am a designer. So what is, what else can I do? Right. And that's hopefully what fair, you know, fair pricing for service design um, group 
can help to do is to educate. And I think that it, it, it seems to me, you know, I don't always think that companies are necessarily being like malicious, like they're trying to undercut us. I think it's just the way that it's always been done. And that yeah. means that for us, it's just the way that's always been done and we're used to it. So even, you know, Porsche's recent, you know, greeting card information, you know, people said, their response was, oh, that seems fair. This seems, you know, there's different talk about it, but what is fair? You know, it's like fair is that you used to get that too, or you've gotten that before, or that's in the range that you got. It's, it's just what you, what we put into it. And so mm -hmm. any way that we can all sort of have that mentality of we are valuable and what's not acceptable and that we don't want to be the cost cutter hairdresser, um, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be an important way to move this industry yeah. forward. Don't feel bad if, you know, we've all made mistakes in the past, you know, it's like if you're watching this and you're thinking, oh no, you know, like I, I Yeah, no, I'm fully like admitting because I was there and I, I'm yeah, telling you. Don't feel bad, you know, like everybody's made mistakes, everybody's been there and hopefully by sharing some of our experience we can help, you know. Yes. People make mistakes, but you know, it's like everything in life, you know, you, you only learn by making mistakes as well. Sometimes. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Raise your prices. If you're, if you're hearing this and this is all sounding like, oh my goodness, I'm way undercharging. Tell your clients, tell your clients that you're going up. And if you have to do it incrementally, do it incrementally. But if they balk at it, then, you know, you say, well, I'm working at my old rate for the next three months. And then at, you know, basically, hey, if now it's August. You could say 2022 if you want. My rates will be going up to this. And, you know, there's lots of different ways to raise your rates. And I think that that's uh, a whole other discussion, you know, that we could get into at a different time. But, um, you know, if you start, if you've started too low or you started low, it's time to, time to move up. So Portia, did you have any more on your list that we didn't talk about? Um, I don't think so. I think you guys, you guys covered it. Um, but I, I, I guess the other thing that was on my list was what Pippa said at the end, which is that it's not just about you. It's really about setting the standards for the industry. And the more of us that can sort of say, all right, no, we're not going to accept this hundred dollar payment for something that took me, you know, a day or more to do, um, just the stronger the industry will be and the more likely that prices will be raised. And, and also I don't think that companies, companies just are going for the bottom line, right? They want to make money. So they look at like their whole process from acquiring the art to manufacturing to distribution. And they're like, well, where can we cut costs? And, we just don't want to be the place where they're paying costs. So, you know, like and the only way to avoid that is to stand up for ourselves. And it's hard and it's scary, but if enough of us do it, I mean, I think it's really worth it in the long run. Agreed, agreed. And I think, I mean, we talked about this last week and I have definitely talked about it before, but being an industry that is, you know, 90% women makes a difference in our you know, collective uh, mindset about money and about uh, negotiation and about in what we're entitled to and all that due to like societal programming, basically. Yeah, and how um, we value ourselves and others value us. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that makes it, you know, a difficult road ahead to get everyone to understand that no, like if, I think it's almost, it's a matter of comparing, of showing what, you know, other industries are making, you know, like showing that graphic designers are making, you know, $5,000 for a logo or whatever, doing this type of work for however much and making so much more. And then it's like, well, hey, hold on now. That's, that's not right. So, right. Um, so yeah, my three were well I had my three but then my I had two little side notes but it's kind of like one is not everyone can do what you do so don't compare yourself right mm -hmm. but that sort of goes along with valuing yourself and all that so that can kind of be and my favorite platitude well one of my favorite platitudes I got a couple um if you don't ask the answer is always no right so just ask for what you want right even if they say no but if you don't ask it's definitely no right so that is that is one of my favorite 
things to say and it applies to most things, but it definitely applies here. So it sounds like if we had to wrap it up, we don't have any pithy sayings yet, except for potentially the one on value that Portia said, but sounds like yeah. the main themes that we were addressing were valuing yourself, flexibility in terms and negotiation, negotiation and flexibility in terms, and then long-term sustainability for the industry in our set, like looking at the bigger picture, let's say. Is that true, Portia? Did you have an another one in there that doesn't quite fit in any of those buckets? I don't, I don't think so. Okay, okay. I actually tell um, you the truth, I can't remember what my third one was. That's okay, okay. don't worry about, about yeah. it. Um, so sort of like looking at the bigger picture, valuing ourselves and, and negotiating um, and flexibility and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, we have to go in and fine tune and, and tweak and figure out how we can say this in the shortest, but most concise or most uh, clear way to explain, you know, what, what we really want to say. And I, you know, for people who are watching and thanks for listening to us kind of hash it out and think, think about it. But I think, you know, all these stories that we have from our own experience are just, are just so important. And so we just want people to remember that the art is valuable. You know, we bring happiness, we bring, oh, that was your other one. It was about yeah. Um, yeah, the, uplifting. The uplift. So that's another, that adds to the value factor, right? Exactly. Uplifting it's, people. Exactly. It's still kind of wrapped in with the third point, but yeah. Slightly yeah. Different. So, so, you know, valuing our art and understanding that we contribute in a, in a meaningful way. Um, and also understanding that there is room for negotiation in all situations. Um, and that, you know, we talked about various ways that you can do that and how you can, if you can't get more money, you can get various other things. And then there's those times when you need to walk away. Right. And then the third one being that, you know, think about the industry, but think about long-term sustainability for your own career. You know, how does the pricing that you're talking about or you're, you're considering going with, how does that, how is that going to affect you in the long run? Which can be hard to tell when you're just starting out and you have sort of a micro view of, of what's really going on. So that one's a tricky one, but some, you know, something very important to remember. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. If you join the Facebook group, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, everybody was there once. And I 100%. think people are very generous. And, you know, if they can help, they will. And if they don't know, they will maybe suggest somewhere you can yeah. help. You yeah, ask. some of the best conversations going on in that group are because someone just asked a question. So definitely mm. agree with that. Definitely. And don't, I think you made a good point about that, you know, Pippa that we've all been there and maybe we have I'm like Portia I know that since you worked in graphic design so long you maybe you were able to skip that step where you accepted something really low at the beginning or whatever um oh, no. but yeah, most, did. no she didn't get to no didn't get to accept that one. um but yeah you know we we have we have been there or we understand why you're there what if mm. we haven't actually been there we understand why you're there so we've got a where I have definitely seen some people in in certain in in Facebook groups having the response of you can't accept that are you out of your mind like whatever <laughs> at least know that most of us are coming from a judgment free zone of understanding that this is a difficult thing pricing is sub so subjective so like there's so many moving parts and it is hard to tack a definitive number on anything so, um, and it's hard to make it in this industry. So, you know, we're definitely coming from a place of understanding rather than I can't believe that you did that for $50 or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, also, and actually, you know, sorry, Portia, you go. Oh, I was just gonna say so far this group is so generous and friendly. Mm -hmm. And if anything, people have shared that they also have had experiences with very low rates. So no one is, like outrage that anyone's accepting a low rate. Mostly it's people commiserate, commiserating saying, oh yeah. I and then that. when you hear someone who says, well, I usually make, you know, way more than you usually make. Um, it's inspiring, right? Cause yeah. it's like, if that person can make it, Th that person is not a special angel artist like you know and I haven't even I'm not even talking about anyone specific but just to say there's no one who's like so you know magical that they that you couldn't get the same thing in 
you know, in the right situation. Mm -hmm. So luck has a lot to do, as much to do with it, you know, in timing, you know, it's, it's not just, ta you know, your talent. Sometimes, you know, some people are in the right place at the right time. It might take you longer than it took them, but you'll get there. Exactly. So there's, yeah, so there is that community aspect and that's why community is so important to me. And I know so many other people and this group is a really great group because you can see, you can see others, you can compare notes, you can see others' experiences. And if it's, you know, lower than you expected, you can cheer them on and say, hey girl, you, can, you don't have to accept that. And if it's higher than you expected, you can say, now I can reach for that. Like now I know that that's possible. And that has happened to me throughout my career, talking to different yeah. artists and hearing different rates and saying, I, I have been in both sides where I've said, you know, I make this hourly and you're working for the same company. So you shouldn't your prices yeah. and I've also been at a point where I'm like there's no way I can make more money it's what's and then asking a friend and hearing that they're making more money and saying oh, oh okay well that's a whole different story then so you know we rise by lifting others yeah. up right I was talking about this today with the in it's for some reason it's so much harder when you're pricing your own work and you see it far more clearly when it's another designer that you know I don't know why it's just so much easier to say I think you know this that would be a good deal that sounds about right to me for their work but as soon as it's your own work suddenly you're like oh, oh you stop questioning yourself and you know you think you're confident about the price and then you're like hang on maybe is that too much is that not enough you know and then so that's supposed to have someone else to ask and they go no yeah you're right it is you, you should get that much you know think of the percentage think how many they're making think of what they're selling them at and then you're like okay yeah okay I was okay you know because we all have these moments of self-doubt and 100%. I think that goes along with the, the last point of, of looking long term. Maybe, maybe it's something more like zoom out, right? Like mm -hmm. look long term, look at yeah, the industry, look at it from an objective point of view instead of looking at your own, you know, this is my mm -hmm. work and oh, well, at the end of the day, it really only did take me four hours and uh, well, you know, I know that I didn't, you know, didn't sell this at the trade show last month. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not worth that much anyways, or whatever it is. Look at it zoomed out. Look at it as somebody else looking in. Um, that's amazing. You made that. That's beautiful. Like that is so worth, worth something, right? Yeah. That reminds me though. Um, I think something that we forget to think about is say you make like, I mean, I don't know what the percentages are for people who've been doing this for a long time, but say you make like 20 patterns and you can sell 15 of them. Well, you have those five patterns that you made that you aren't getting paid for. So that's like another way mm -hmm. of thinking about how to price your work. You know, you're not pricing just for that one pattern. You're also pricing it for all those patterns that maybe aren't, or, you know, placement art, placement graphics that aren't going to sell. And so it's, um, it's we, we can oversimplify charging for our work and there's really more complexity and you need to think about all the time. Overall. I know. And I think it's paralyzing. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah, I wish it could yeah. be simple because all those factors yeah. make it like, I don't know what to do. Like I can't <laughs> even, I don't even want to approach anyone because if they ask me what my prices are, I have no idea. Like if I, I'm, I don't want to ruin it for the industry. I don't want to ruin it for my future self. I don't want, you know, that's like, that is anxiety right there. That's like just yeah. waiting to, <laughs> So, so that's the problem. Like, that's why people just are like, I don't, uh, you know, this is why it's a very complex topic, but the point is we're here for you. We are excited. And I want to thank these ladies so much, Pippa and Portia for joining me today. And I'm hoping to make this some sort of series. Hopefully we'll end up having more of these type of conversations. Um, and so I really appreciate it and check out the links in the description. In conclusion, we had a nice discussion to really talk about where we were coming from in the industry and I appreciate you sticking around to listen to it. And we are still working on crystallizing those exact phrases. But as I sort of summarized, you know, the first tenant would be to value yourself, value your work, understand that your work has value. The second would be around understanding that you can negotiate. There is flexibility and, you know, learning to negotiate is an important thing. And the third is zooming out and understanding how your current pricing is going to set you up for a sustainable career, how it might reflect on the industry as a whole. And using those three principles 
is going to make it a lot easier for you to actually think about concrete numbers which is something we do talk about in the Facebook group and we certainly hope to have more resources around eventually. But having those three pieces in mind is gonna make a big difference as you figure out actual numbers. If you love learning about surface pattern design and creative business, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow me on Instagram at eSilverDesign. Also, I would be super grateful if you shared this channel with your surface pattern friends. Thank <laughs> you.